I never really expected to uh, to write. And I think the context of my career will make it pretty clear as to why I never really expected to be someone writing a book about community. I actually started my career. <laughs> thanks. I started my career as a developer. And that was actually from a start as being a commodities trader. So I had this really a very different background, a very different beginning in my career. Uh, moved around a few places, ended up in sales, doing big, huge deals at companies like Oracle. And then I did a 180 degree shift to being a startup founder. So I started an HR tech company. Uh, long story short, it didn't really work out. And the timing was awful. It was right during the, uh, the financial crisis. Back in, in 2008, 2009, if anyone remembers that, uh, was not a good time to be starting a, uh, an enterprise tech company when everything was all about social media. But from that experience, I learned so much. And one of the things that was a real foundational learning was this idea of how you build networks and connect with people in authentic ways. And so I have started blogging quite a bit, had a blog called Strong Opinions. I built this huge network. I started to do a lot of investing and advising in startups, which led me to start to help founders specifically in this area of how to sell, how to go to market. And I was getting all these one-on-one -on -one requests to basically provide the same advice over and over again. I thought this was nuts. So I said, let me direct people to maybe some sort of group that could help. But there were no groups in New York City. And so I decided to go ahead and put together a meetup group. And I thought, OK, maybe 20 people will show up. But I, I sent a note to all the founders I knew. I invited a few salespeople I knew who I trusted, put together a panel, and said, OK, let me see what, what works. Well, that was the start of this thing called the Enterprise Sales Forum. And it wasn't 20 people that showed up. It was 80 people. And from there, it just started to grow. And I didn't know, I didn't really expect it to grow as quickly as it did. But eventually, people in different cities started to reach out saying, hey, how can I start my own chapter at Enterprise Sales Forum? And this thing's been going for six years now and still continues even in the virtual world. And that just built into its own thing. And I didn't, you know, I looked around for advice or guidance and like, how do I manage this thing? What do I do? I did kind of in the, maybe about three years ago or so, another a, uh, an operations guide so that I can just give this kind of my lessons learned to people who are starting chapters in Enterprise Sales Forum. It was maybe 18 pages. It had checklists. It was pretty comprehensive. And then fast forward a bunch of years later, I went, I was uh, overflow to launch a new, uh, new product. Stack Overflow is all about this huge online community of developers, which is actually why my, why you saw my medium blog dev biz ops. That was actually part of my strategy to grow the product and to grow awareness. So I built a community, unbeknownst to me, I built a community around that. And then I ended up uh, moving on to AWS where someone I was working with said, hey, we're looking at user groups. And does anyone have anything that could help there? So I sent my operations guide. And then afterwards I thought, wow, uh, there's a whole lot that I didn't add that I've learned in the past three years particularly about virtual events. So let me add some things and send it along. So I did that. And then it got to maybe 30 pages. I wrote a few more pages and I sent it out to about 40 people to say, hey, uh, what do you think? Well, the feedback was pretty brutal. And uh, <laughs> quite frankly, it was not a, they're like, why didn't you talk about this? Like, what? Like, I don't understand that. So, I just went on a writing tear for two months to complete 
basically what is the book that you have that you're showing the uh, the viewers here and that was community in a box and i was just thinking oh well i'll just do this as an ebook but eventually it got so big that i was like oh let me just create a book i went out to publishers they said it would take six months minimum to release i'm like screw that i'll just publish it myself and so there you go that is the story of community in a box and so i like to tell people i'm a, a community builder by accident i had no expectations no long-term planning and everything that's that i pour into the book was everything i learned in the process of building the enterprise sales forum some experiences in building communities inside companies for stack overflow to use our new enterprise product and also the kind of lessons i've started to learn about how aws operates and how we think about community so i just pulled from a lot of different experiences great and i guess like even going further back so like when we talk about foundation was there like further back was there a you were a part of or somewhere where you first where was it like you first ever got exposed to community to sort of that like maybe hit that light to it oh this is community where there is something you are joining or something you heard about even before you get into like the enterprise sales well it's funny because a lot of that experience around community formed around the the ashes of my old hr tech startup because I didn't have a community. I didn't have this really deep network. And I realized that that was actually a huge flaw in my strategy because I didn't, I didn't know developers that could help uh, take the reins for a product and, and lead in the direction you need to go. I didn't have the connections to investors. I didn't have connections to other entrepreneurs that I can just commiserate with or, uh, or just get some advice. So in the New York City tech community, it was starting to grow really rapidly. And this is about 2009, 2010. And so there were some really foundational experiences I had. One was Startup Weekend, which was an initiative started by Andrew Hyde. Uh, another was the New York Tech Meetup, which had started basically just like a few dozen people and then became this huge uh, operation. And I'd say, uh, looking at WeWork, now I know we look at WeWork today and say, wow, you know, that was, there were some issues there. But early on, it really did have this community feel. And that community feel started with this experiment called WeWork Labs, which was let's get a bunch of entrepreneurs very early stage together. We'll get 50 of them, we'll put them in one place, uh, super low cost co working, but we'll, add events and we'll make it like we're all helping each other out. And that was a brainchild of uh, Matt Champagne and Jesse Middleton to put that together and launch it. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Like here are people from all these different backgrounds helping each other, uh, being supportive. And that was kind of the inklings of my thinking about this notion of okay community is a thing okay it's something that you can actually be proactive about and build without necessarily calling a community back then i just said wow this is like a great startup thing and then for you know we talked a little bit in you know, one of the this amazing community the enterprise just for everyone here what were some of maybe um like one or two challenges that you had here and, and sort of what did you do to overcome them because a lot of communities we talk about it like one month and then 12 months later it's like hey hey wait a minute where did that go and here we are all these years later and that that thing is still thriving so what are some of like the your obstacles or challenges that you would have with it um, that can kind of inform people because oftentimes you hit one roadblock and it feels like the world's ending. So maybe like one or two obstacles, challenges you had there and what you did to overcome. Them. Yeah, I, um, this is actually a later addition to community in a box. So I realized even before I get to like the setbacks, 
one of the things to, to recognize and maybe just be very candid and transparent is uh, community building is it's freaking hard. Uh, it's draining. Uh, and I often do compare building a community to launching a startup, but with even less resources and with even less support. Uh, because when you're, it seems exciting, but to your point, like, to try and continue to grow and the scale, it can take a toll. And I mentioned Andrew Hyde before, and when I shared the manuscript of my book, uh, his only feedback was, yeah, I don't think you talk about the burnout enough. And so it's important to be realistic with the energy you have and the availability and the strength because you won't be able to do it alone long term. Like I did it long term for Enterprise Sales Forum. I, I believed in the vision. I knew that it could be this incredible resource to help uh, salespeople to level up their game and turn around perfect professional careers. There were people that had gone to an uh, enterprise sales forum event and they were they were on their, their way out of sales. They were on the way out of an entire career path because they weren't getting the guidance and the nurturing in their in their current job. And they went to an enterprise sales forum event and they told me months later that they completely turned around their careers. They went from being on a, a professional improvement plan to being the leading rep on their team. So I knew it was important. I knew that the vision was making an impact, but the, the real struggle was how can I maintain my own energy? And I just realized by, uh, by the end of 2017, I was freaking exhausted. Like I was, I just felt checked out. I wasn't excited about things. And so I talk a lot about the burnout. I talk a lot about the setbacks that, that occur because like one or two setbacks can be tough. When you have setback after setback, it can, it just feels like a, a pummeling effect where you just don't seem to get any breaks. And so a couple that come to mind, I think that were uh, just pretty eye-opening, but also transformational for the enterprise sales form was uh, one was an incident that involved harassment. And I know it's a big, big topic in communities, uh, particularly tech communities. It's this whole idea that you're going to have people from many different backgrounds and experiences that potentially come and there could be friction. And that actually happened at the launch of my Denver enterprise sales forum chapter, where I thought we had a really great, uh, a really great launch. It was only after the fact I learned that there was a couple of, uh, there are a couple of men that harassed the women in attendance. Uh, I, that just that gutted me. You know, I tried to figure out what happened. I got the details. I profusely apologized to the women that had joined the group and then left because of the uh, that experience. And that actually led me to uh, be very proactive in terms of reaching out to women, women's groups, to try to bring them to the events, to have them speak on at our events, uh, I had I set up a like a a no mantle policy, so you couldn't have uh, panels that had all men. And I also launched this thing called the Enterprise, uh, the Women in Sales Month. So every October, all of our chapters globally would would feature women speakers. Now the topic didn't have to be women in sales, but I wanted to at least use it as an opportunity to highlight the fact that there are some amazingly talented women, amazingly talented, underrepresented groups that are in sales, in sales leadership, and let's take the opportunity to elevate those voices. So that was kind of the first thing is thinking about diversity and inclusion. 
I think one of the lessons learned from the enterprise sales forum is uh, think about that first. Like, you know, have that on the top of your mind as you build the community, as you bring on volunteers and bring on leaders. I think the second thing to think about is um, how are you going to support yourself as a community? Like, we may want to talk about, you know, growing and scaling later on in this talk, but, you know, money matters. Now, at some point you get to think about, well, what does the future hold? And for the enterprise sales forum, we decide to double down on sponsorships. Well, sponsorships are okay, but if you don't have the capabilities in place to make those sponsorships really successful, uh, it can become problematic. And you don't want to ever, at least my perspective was, I don't want to have people have a negative experience in working with or being involved in enterprise sales form. But I just realized that as we're bringing on bigger and bigger sponsors, they had more and more requests that we couldn't, we, we just weren't able to serve. It was taking up mostly my time to build reports, to follow up on the chapter leaders, uh, because it, it was a completely 100% volunteer driven organization. So I can't boss people or manage people to say, hey, make sure you, you make these announcements or you know, make sure that you give time to our sponsors. Uh, it became all consuming, plus I had a day job at Stack Overflow. So that's when I made the, the decision to end sponsorships completely throughout the entire enterprise sales forum and rely exclusively on, on event ticket sales. And that was a hard decision because it meant not doing things that we wanted to do probably, but long term, I think it had a, a, a benefit. But when you do these types of things, there's an equation, right? So you got to think of uh, how do I balance that so we don't put ourselves in a financial hole. So uh, maybe a bit longer than you expected, but I really want to dive in on uh, those two setbacks in particular. Yeah, and I think I mean that's great. You know, a lot of times we obsess over the that new user experience, right? The thirty, sixty, ninety, but then it's like for a lot of where we get, you know, building community, that's it's really the setbacks that show the, the strength of our character, uh, but also help to elevate us and take us to places we might not have, uh, you know, might not have gotten to otherwise, right? So you're talking about very candidly about your experience, you know, even with the diversity, inclusion, and, and females, but out of kind of a, a dark spot, you were able to address the side of your community and also to elevate, lift them up, but overall for the overall healthier community to really, uh, you know, almost like put a spotlight on it, but to really expand it out because of that. So sometimes the setbacks are are brutal, but at other times they're kind of almost, I don't want to say necessary, but they really help to push us to where we, we might not otherwise be gone. So it's great just kind of hearing those stories because then for other people out there on this call or that might hear about this later, it's like setbacks are, are not always going to be like, obstacles and, and a cliff. These are like chances for us to grow. These are opportunities for us to take the community um, to even more exciting horizons, things like that. So that's very okay. great to hear your experience on that. Um, and so we kind of got the enterprise sales. So you also were at Stack Overflow. So before we get into the book, what are some of the cool stuff over at, because it's a giant community. So what are some of the cool memories at Stack Overflow? Uh well, I want to say yeah, absolutely for anyone uh, viewing right now, they, the, the best perspective is to think about setbacks as opportunities. I had an entrepreneurial background, so to me it was kind of ingrained, but definitely look at the opportunity side of things that, uh, that may appear negative on the onset. But with Stack Overflow, it was it was a super interesting opportunity. It was uh, some people I knew there, they wanted to launch a completely new business. So Stack Overflow, for those that don't know them all that well, it's a community for developers. And when I say a community for developers, it's one of the, or is the largest 
community of uh, available programming knowledge on the planet. And so it started back in 2008 by two well-known developers slash bloggers. Uh, they were frustrated with the fact that there was no good way of exchanging information between experts that was free and open. And so they created it. And now I think it's well over about 50 to something, I think up to 60 million unique viewers every month on Stack Overflow. Uh, and it's, it's all for developers and it's a great repository of knowledge. And they also have uh, multiple different sites under the Stack Exchange banner. So it's not only Q&A about programming knowledge, there's also uh, forums or Q&A for cooking, for you know, different religions, for languages, for uh, physics, like all sorts of cool stuff. But what was interesting is that they grew up as a business uh, selling ads and selling job postings. But then they got all, this, all these requests from companies that wanted to have a stack overflow, a Q&A site, but for inside organization. If you think about inside organization, what do we use for knowledge today? We use things like Slack. Maybe if you're in the in a technical role, you're in JIRA or Confluence. You may have some like wikis somewhere or SharePoint. Like we just have this, this big collection of just stuff to try and collect knowledge and to be able to share effectively. So the idea of having a stack overflow inside a company was to help consolidate some of that. So you have, uh, so you have knowledge that is useful to a broad set of people, is evergreen, and is something that you want to have last for a while, right? So, and there's all sorts of knowledge that can be put in that category. The challenge though, is that you're trying to take a big, huge, you know, tens of millions type community and try to replicate that type of experience in a company. Does it work? Uh, yes and no. It's not about the technology. The technology can definitely help and the brand could help, but ultimately you need to figure out what is the community dynamic? What is the what's in it for me, for people to want to participate? And oftentimes it, we didn't necessarily understand how the cultural dynamics would play into a successful implementation of Stack Overflow Enterprise. So in some instances, it worked famously. Like we, you know, I, I got all of our biggest and largest first sales in some massive organizations. And so in some places, like, like very big banks, it worked really well. But in some other places, it didn't work so well. And when I look back at why it worked in other places versus not, it comes down to how you think about scaling a community so I have a principle called the 50, 500, 5,000 principle I talk about. And another concept called the 1, 9, 90 rule. And so those are like the two core foundational lessons I took from my experience at Stack Overflow is that one, you got to recognize that you can't just bring everyone on board all at once. You have the empty, kind of the empty database problem or the chicken and egg problem. So you're trying to draw people into something that has no value yet. And on the other hand, there's always this expectation that everyone's going to be a participant. Everyone is going to want to uh, uh, be involved. And that's the wrong approach. That, that's the wrong metric. It's the wrong objective. If that's a goal, that goal is going to fall flat on its face. Because the rule of communities is that a certain percentage, a very small percentage will be very active. It'll be kind of a little bit of a larger group that will be somewhat active. And most people will, they're just kind of read, they're readers, they're lurkers. And if you understand those dynamics going into whatever community you're building up front, then I think you'll be better equipped to building a community which will last. Great. Thanks for that. And, and completely agree. So we've 
for, for anyone that just joined or is joined. So we've talked about Mark's career, kind of where he came into community, the enterprise sales form, amazing community, and then his experience at, at Stack Overflow. It's like, you know, and, and we'll segue into the book. It's like so many people obsess over 2 million registered, things like that. Then you look at even like a site like Twitch, but they'll tell you their top 1% is 150 users that they care about. Oh, yeah. It's driving like a huge thing. And other people like 150 people show up. They're like, oh my gosh, it's such a low turnout. And it's like, so there is like, so I always love to hear that because it's like we get so lost into this like uh, quantitative number, high numbers versus like strength, strength of community. Um, so I just love hearing stuff like that. And now, just so that in our last half hour, Mark has this book, Community in a Box. So let's really focus on that before we get into questions. So early on, you talked that you, you have written this book for three audiences in mind. So tell us those three audiences and kind of like for the community, curious or builders today, if they go out and get this book, what they can expect. Yeah, um, <laughs> I tell you, I didn't know who this book was going to be for, and I'm thinking, wow, this is like going to be such a niche. Uh, what was helpful was, and I, I just advise this for anyone that is working on any sort of project, whether it's a book, a blog, like uh, videos, whatever. Bring people you know and trust into the process. Be transparent. Build in public. I can't emphasize that enough. Don't just go into your hole and build something. Get advice. Because when I gave the manuscript out to those 40 people, their feedback was so vitally important. And it actually helped me to realize that, yes, the book, it's still going to be a, a niche audience. But there's going to be different perspectives. So you know, my perspective was, oh, I'm a newbie. I don't know anything about this whole community building thing, but I think it'd be kind of cool. That's one audience. But I think the bigger audience actually is the, the audience of those that are already in, involved in building communities that know some of the setbacks we talked about, maybe have experienced that burnout, are kind of at, a, kind of at like this, this weird juncture where their community is kind of, it's, it, doing okay but it's not really growing and they've stalled out and so i think there's a a very big audience of community organizers community managers that are out there currently where i, I think some of the things I, I put in the book can help them and then also there's a, a third group which is this very interesting and growing community of people that are building communities for their companies Right. So, you know, you hear lots of these different concepts like community based marketing or you see a lot of these investment firms building community funds. This word community, I've got to tell you, I don't think I've heard it more uh, in the past nine years. Than I've heard it this year. And maybe COVID was responsible for, for a lot of this, but I also think there's just a realization that you know, this dynamic of big open social media and networking sites is not what people are really looking for. That's not adding a ton of value to people's lives. It's actually subtracting a lot of value and a lot of people's time. And people are looking for something which is maybe a bit more intimate, a little bit less loud, a little bit more purposeful among people that they have like interests with and values. And so I think for companies, they're starting to realize that this idea of community can be another mechanism to engage with their customers, their audiences, their prospects. And so I think this book also provides some valuable insights for those people that are being told by their executive teams, launch a community now, and are like, wow, <laughs> God, like, hey, People, how am I going to do that? Like, who just launches a community? And it's, this will be really interesting because there's things within AWS that we're also starting to think about as well around community. And so 
I think this is a perfect time to do the work that I do as a principal startup advocate within uh, Amazon Web Services to really raise the banner of community as a critical mechanism and platform for uh, growing your business in the future. But I will say there's an interesting fourth uh, audience. This is not something I, I kind of thought about initially, but something that's kind of dawned on me recently, which is people that have or trying to develop a small uh, following for the things that they do, the things that they create. So I think there's a fourth audience, which is the creator class. They're not companies. They're not just there to launch a, a community for the sake of building a community around their interests, but specifically around the things that they're creating. And so I think that there's like, uh, those musicians, artists, whomever who are building some re really cool stuff, creating some really great art, that there's an opportunity to use some of the lessons learned in the book as well. So we talked about uh, Mark's book here again, Community in a Box. So we're talking about the audiences. That he, so you've, you have it essentially grouped into four sections. So the interesting yep. part is that a lot of community books, you know, where they usually start off with is actually on Mark's second part, which is build, building the community. But what's the main problem with that? If you jump straight there is like where we have to say, wait a minute, what's your foundation? And there's, there's no like, there's no shortcuts, as you mentioned, there's no getting around it. So if you want to talk just a little bit about part one of your book, you know, essentially being purposeful and building the right foundation. Yeah. Uh, there's um, people ask me why I started the enterprise sales forum. And so I think that's where I started to launch the book is what were some of those initial questions? And so Whoever you know out there has heard of Simon Sinek, he talks a lot about start with why. Because the why is the thing you really care about. It's it's the thing that's driving you towards some action. And the problem with, with why is that you don't really know what the long-term goal or vision is, oftentimes. You're just they're thinking about, hey, a community would be kind of cool to launch because it actually solves a very specific problem you have at that point in time. For me, it was, I need to get back my time from all these one-on-one -on -one meetings, talking about sales and talking about the same thing over and over again with startup founders. That made no sense. So a better mechanism would be maybe I could find a group. Well, that didn't work. And so that's what actually led me to what I call the mini why, which is I need to get back my time. Let me just put salespeople and startup founders together and they could help each other out. That was why I started Enterprise Sales Forum. It wasn't any sort of grand vision to uh, level up the sales profession. And so I had this mini why, I need to get my time back. It turned into a what, which is, okay, let me create this, this meetup group. And then over time, I started to realize, wow, this is having an impact. But the impact is different than what I expected. And that leads to your bigger why, like why you want to do this and why you want to continue doing this. Because you now understand that the impact is maybe kind of aligned to your mini why. Maybe it's something different. So that's where you start. And I think another important element is to, is to understand that building community, even though you may be the catalyst and you have the passion, it's way, way easier to bring people on board because that, that's also your sounding board. Those are your first leaders. And it's important to you know, bring those people of like mind and interest and they may not necessarily have the same level of passion that you do. 
but get some of that help early on. Uh, you know, in fact, I didn't actually launch the enterprise sales forum myself. I only launched it because I had uh, someone else who was super passionate about this idea and wanted to launch it with me. And so at least I had like a person to help me out in the beginning um, until much later on when I started to bring other people on and these you know, different chapter leaders and it started to expand into a much larger group. So I think those are probably like the two important things to think about. It's uh, understand why this thing you want to create, this community you want to build, why you want to get started, what impact it's going to have. And also don't build alone. Building alone sucks. Build alone, that's a great, that's a great. I'll do two more questions and then we'll jump into the Q&A. And so then uh, the final two questions here in our, our fireside chat. So one, you've got the book or the part of the book, page 140. It's already got it bookmarked in my head, uh, which is on sustain versus scale, where essentially we're talking about uh, four, yeah. four things, which you have broken down into geography, horizontal slash vertical, and online. So for a lot of us today, it's like where they're a little bit struggling with is I've got a community of active users that's 50 or 500 or all these different numbers that we're throwing around. It's like it. And so they're kind of like struggling with what's the right size for me? Do I just sustain with what I have and keep going? Or do I try to scale this even more? And then so what Mark does is break it down into the geography and then into horizontal versus vertical, and then last online. So just for those not familiar with this, uh, give them a little bit of a teaser for this page 140 of your book. Yeah, so sustain versus scale is, it's a concept I bring from the startup world, which is at some point you got to recognize what your trajectory is and why you want that trajectory. The, and typically what happens with startups is that they'll take investment funds, they'll try and build, but what they're building doesn't necessarily hit the expectations of growth that their investors have. Uh, this causes m major amounts of stress. Eventually the startup will fold or Sometimes it just kind of continues on with this like life and existence because they have enough customers to sustain, but it's never going to be a unicorn. And so in some respects, I take not all, but some of those lessons and think about the fact that there's communities that are going to be okay being the size that they are. And that's not a bad thing. But if you think that there is some, your vision, again, getting back to like why you are really starting this, like what is the big impact you're trying to make on the world? Thinking about scale can be important. And I talk about the idea of doing that through this concept called the community flywheel. So walking through you know, how you recruit volunteers, how you uh, build your promotion cycle, how you build systems and financial capabilities to you know, sustain this, this growth that you're trying to build into, how you continuously measure and evolve so that you're always at, in a cycle of reinventing and re-energizing the community. Right? So everything starts from the community firewall if you're thinking about scale, if you're thinking about long-term growth of your community. But that chapter um, to sustain or to, or to grow or to scale or sustain and scale, it's thinking about strategically, what does that mean? Now for the enterprise sales forum, I kind of took two approaches. My very first 
aspect of uh, of thinking about the scale was there are different groups because there are different people that I'm starting to see enter the community, right? So one of the things about the the chapter I have on measuring impact is collecting or understanding who is your audience, who is in the community, who are you attracting? And what I noticed from the enterprise sales form is I had some you know, enterprise or very skilled B2B sales professionals, but I also had this other group that were very new in their career. They were, you know, sales was their first job, they were right out of college. And I recognized that, yeah, there's value for them to attend the enterprise sales forum, but maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to do something else. And I knew this was the right the right decision to create another group called the sales development forum. When four people out of the blue reached out to me within the course of a week and said, Hey, you know, do you think it might be worthwhile having a separate group just for sales development reps? So that to me was like, yeah, I'm sold. Let's do it. And so that's one type of scale. Now, the other type of scale was thinking about geographies. So, I kept on getting a lot of inbound requests from places like Boston and Washington, DC and San Francisco and Dallas to say, Hey, would, you know, would you be interested in starting a chapter here? And so this is daunting, right? This is not, I will say like a <laughs> China scale geographically is super challenging. Uh, but I took on the challenge. And so I went out on the road and I launched pretty much all of these communities that we have today. And that eventually led me to going out to London, uh, to Singapore and Hong Kong. So this whole network, but I felt it was important from two perspectives. One, yes, I'm getting people who are like kind of interested and passionate about starting a chapter, but two, they're starting from scratch. They're like where I was a few years back and they really need the support. They need to feel that the leadership of the community has their back. So yeah, I think scaling geography wise is wonderful if you can do it, but recognize that it does take just a ton of resources, a ton of time to do that. Um, because the only way to really do that is to be with the people because they don't have that connection with the leaders. You can kind of feel just left out. So those are like my, my two, I think, big lessons from, from scaling that hopefully isn't is useful for folks listening. Yeah, great. And thanks for that. And then the last question before we go over to Q and a, so uh, uh, kind of the question that I get at so many community meetups and that I hear a lot, and just to kind of get your perspective on it, people, there's this kind of like community imposter syndrome. A lot of people are, are kind of feeling like, wow, you know, am I in the right place? Am I doing community right? So just very much in these things, they're like just, you know, really feel like a community builder imposter and we're having to say, you know, everyone's kind of been at a different, hit that in different ways. So when people kind of hit that, like, community imposter syndrome, even if they're doing great work, because a lot of times they don't, they may not know another community professional or be like, is what we're doing great? Or how do we compare? They don't always have that. So from your perspective, as someone who came to you and said, Mark, I'm feeling this community imposter syndrome, what would you tell them? And what would you tell people out there that are going through that? uh you're not alone like that's to me that's the the, the biggest lessons i've learned in all this is uh there are other people out there now when i started mind you this was back in 2014 uh with the enterprise sales form it was there weren't a lot of resources there's no cmx uh there weren't a whole lot of people necessarily talking about 
community on Twitter. Like there were things like meetup, right? There's meetup.com, but they were completely help useless in helping me with anything. Um, so I really did feel like I had to do everything on my own. Uh, that is so not the case anymore. I can't, I mean, the, the resources that are available, uh, I mean, just CMX in and of itself is an amazing, amazing community for people in the community. And there's more and more people that are writing books and there's people that are speaking publicly about you know, community and how to do community. Uh, there's a lot of robust conversation. If you follow the hashtag community on Twitter, you'll run across like so many great people that I never knew previously. Like, you know, uh, like all these people that I, that I could have actually uh, used and leaned on so many years ago, but only now discovering because now I've kind of put on this lens of community as, as a thing to focus on. But recognize that you're not alone. And that's why I say, why well, I, I said just earlier, don't build alone. It's super helpful to have uh, people around you that are supporting you, that are that you can ask questions of, to to sharing each other's energy and enthusiasm and excitement, but also just to to let go, to let off steam, to be able to talk through a lot of those frustrations. Uh, and I'm not someone who was naturally a talker growing up, uh, very reserved. Uh, kind of kept everything inside. My my biggest guidance is don't. Just find someone to talk to. Just share openly. And there's plenty of places to do that these days. Um, you know, probably the, the best place, again, being CMX, because just there's such a well-established community and people are so willing to help. I think that's also the encouraging thing is – Unlike other professions, I think there's a natural inclination for people in the community space to share. So don't feel you're in this alone. There's definitely a lot of people. And you know, if you want to chat with me, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me at Startup Mark. I'm definitely pretty active on Twitter. So I'm willing to help as well. Great, thanks for that. So we, we covered a lot of ground, so we'll do some Q&A here. Don't forget, Community Inbox book, it is out. You can get it, all the great book places. So we'll turn it over to the Q&A. Um, you can be in the text chat for the Q&A, or you can come up here and be on video. So if you want to be on video with us, you can come up and be on Yeah, it'd be cool. Anybody? Yeah, I got a bomb video. It'll just be like a coffee chat. Yeah, exactly. So we'll do. Still learning Bevy virtual, so figuring all this stuff out. <laughs> I'll just throw some people up here. If you don't want to be up here, that's cool too. So I will say it's a, it's a cool platform, though. Definitely props uh, to what Bevy's built. Get any of these right around. Let's see. Yeah, if you don't want to show, share video or anything else, that's cool too. You can also share audio. So we have questions for, uh, let's see. So Valentina says, sorry, not camera ready, but you can be audio ready. So you can still be like, your voice can still be heard. So even if you don't want to share your, your video, you can still share your audio too. Or you can just put questions in the chat. So do we have questions for Mark? Um, and if you want to be on stage, you can we can make sure that you're up here. So feel free to unmute your audio or just put a question in the chat. Let us know how we're doing. There's going to be a survey after this comes to your email inbox. Uh, take that survey. Don't want to be a Dawson's Creek meme inside. So do we have any questions for uh, Mark today? Any thoughts on, on his book? Are you excited now to, to get the book? Uh, let us know in the chat or you can just unmute on audio. So let us know. 
And Valentina, I, this, you're usually not the shy one, so I'm expecting at least one question from you. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> All right. I, mean, I, I, I got a question for folks. Uh, sure. What is uh, uh, okay? So let me uh, let me tell you people how uh, how you can get in touch with me. But in the meantime, I want to know like what is what is the biggest struggle folks here have in in their community today? Like what what's a kind of like that one thing which is uh, that you're stuck with or that you have a um, that you have a challenge with. I, I'd love to hear like your thoughts. Is it scaling? Is it growing? Is it around diversity? Is it you know, financial aspects? Is it uh, is it running a virtual events? Something I've gotten a lot better at, but still learning myself. can also talk about the process of writing the book, which is, is also a pretty interesting experience. I, I gotta tell you, I, working with publishers, like I feel like I went back to 19th century. <laughs> it's like, like yeah, well, uh, if we publish your book, we'll be able to get it out um, the soonest in June of 2021. I'm like, what? <laughs> June of 2020? Wait, it's, it's August of 2020, what are you doing in between now and then? So, wow. Yeah, I mean, the books are like sometimes years, years in the making, so it's never, not always like an easy thing. So does anyone have any challenges that they're willing to, to share with us? Um, we promise we'll only share this on YouTube and tell everybody in your family. So let's see, Lynn says, I want to build a customer ad advocate community, but need to find what I can offer them. Yeah. Uh, I imagine, Lynn, uh, by customer advocate, you're just trying to find those customers that are using whatever your company's product is or services, and they're, they've been pretty successful, and you want to just kind of build around them, which I think is an awesome start, right? You want people that are going to be aligned with the, and love the things that you do. Like those are your those are your first community members. But you're right. Like, what's in it for me? Like you always ask the the Whiffham question. And so, the way that we we think about it is at AWS as an example is we have a number of different programs that we've established uh, for different types of people that are kind of active in the community and they're a little bit more uh, out there and doing cool things around AWS services. So we have things like the AWS Heroes program, at the Community Builders program, and we have a uh, Scouts program. And so with these programs, a lot of what we're doing is trying to build exclusivity and that's something that customers crave. They want the special attention. They want access to executives. Uh, they want the private events or, or swag. So you start to think about what are things that could really get people uh, really excited about wanting to be part of a program. And so you, you start to think about what are the internal motivations that get people excited about stuff? And you realize there's only a few things that really get people uh, excited about doing anything and participating. But the biggest one is recognition. Recognition, recognition, recognition. So, and the other side of it is special attention. People love uh, when you're paying attention and care about their interests. And those are actually mechanisms that work across any different type of medium. So Stack Overflow, perfect example. How do people uh, get excited about being on Stack Overflow? Well, you gain reputation points and badges. And so as you gain reputation and badges, that raises your profile. Uh, people see that on your, on your page and you get more access to things. So you actually have 
you start to gain these superpowers that other users don't have. And so that's the idea of, of, of hooking into the, the, these, what I call influence levers. So these influence levers, and there's a really great book called Influence that I highly recommend by Robert Caldini. But the book Influence goes into these different types of mechanisms that get people to, to do things. And so if you read that book and you think about the, those psychological triggers that we all have, I mean, they're built into people, then you can start to use some of those levers, not in like sinister or, or um, ways. I don't, I don't want to go down that route, but ways that actually can nudge certain behaviors or interests. So that's the way I would think about a customer advocate program is figure out what might be those, those triggers that would get them interested. Hopefully yeah. it's somewhat helpful. Let's see, let me get another one. Yeah, she said, excellent, thank you. And it's interesting to your point, Mark, it's like a lot of times people say, well, I don't have the budget, I don't have the swag. And what we often have to say is like, you know, when you think about the customer journey, customer experience, when they get onto your digital turf or your community from the, from the time they enter it to the time they leave, you control that experience. So you can make it, whether your budget is $2, or two billion, it's like you control that experience. You make that experience great regardless of your budget, what you can do and from, from when they get on to get off, like you, getting that right is so much a part of it. So if you can't get that right, it doesn't matter like if you're giving away like $500 golden hoodies or, or other type stuff. Um, let me, but while we have it here, let me just quickly do the drawing. So we got a drawing for, for Mark's ebook. I got this really cool uh, tool called uh, Wheel of Names. Let me figure out how to share that really quick. Meanwhile, what would also be a really cool drawing is getting one of those five hundred dollar golden hoodies. I think that 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 should be like a next uh, next giveaway. Yeah. Uh, there we go. So can everyone see the screen? Yep. Okay. So we we're gonna do Wheel of Names. So we're gonna do like a ebook giveaway for a community in box, which means we'll give away for one like, lucky winner here. Uh, so we got a few of the people here that, that joined. So if you don't see your name, just throw something at me and we'll figure something out. I think I got that. Yeah, it's like, do I have audio numbers? So we'll do a quick spin. Yep, unfortunately, Baby Yoda won, but Baby Yoda had to leave. So we will spin again. We'll take Baby Yoda off. Congratulations, Baby Yoda, for attending. So let's do it one, another one with an, someone from planet Earth. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Mark Zuckerberg left. <laughs> yeah, Mark Mark Zuckerberg is, uh, I don't know. I, if he was on, thank you, Mark, for joining. I'm uh, highly honored. All right. You probably could take that questions about that. the building from the book. So Nicolette, we will, I'll be reaching out to you to get a copy of this book to you. So congratulations, Nicolette. I don't know if you're still on or not, and I will stop sharing. And let's see, was Nicolette already, yeah, Nicolette's already left, so they have like, talking to absolutely nobody, great. Um, and then, so we actually just said that Tatiana said, I bought the book and started reading, content is super. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Already getting the word amount out there. And, and then just with the session today, I'll be put, putting a thing on LinkedIn with screen cap of this. Tell your friends about it. Um, if I miss tagging you in there, just, just let us know. Uh, Mark will be on there too. So he'll be tagged into this post. You can get him at the LinkedIn. Hopefully we'll have Mark back here in a few months since a lot of people are just starting it we'll round everybody up after you've had like a few weeks to kind of digest it, get past all the holiday stuff of December, which is like, so yeah, absolutely. yeah especially in 2020, don't even know what the, the holiday time would be even crazier, but uh, pretty much uh, that's, that's going to be it for today. I don't know. We'll see what happens with the recording on the CMX side. So this is just an amazing um, talk, Mark, very candid, very much opening up about your community experience. I think there is so much here, um, actionable and also like reassuring and uh, reaffirming for people that 
that work in community to really hear these kind of real world stories. Because what I like in bringing in people like you is like sometimes you get this very high level theoretical stuff, which is interesting, but, pe but it's like the difference between like something you do in practice versus something you do like in the real world. So it's really great to get real world experiences from um, your experience at the with the sales community and then with uh, Stack Overflow and, and also with the book and other places where where you've been that have influenced that. So it's just really great to get you out here today. Um, and hopefully everybody here had a great time. I'm still looking at the, the chat. Uh, Lynn also says this has been great. So thank you so much for that. And so what I'll do, not on my side, uh, we've got events.cmx.com, events going on all the time. Um, we also got this survey. Don't forget to survey. Check out Valentina's stuff in Madrid. Valentina and Seppi are just doing so much amazing stuff. Um, also check out Valentina's stuff on Disciple. She's doing so much amazing stuff over at Disciple these days. But in order to close this out, I will let Mark kind of like give us some parting words today. So for Mark, the floor is yours. This is not like a victory speech per se, but I'll let you sort of just close this out today with this group of community professionals. And then for everybody that's going to be watching this video at a later date, wherever CMX puts that, whether it's on YouTube or MySpace or wherever. Sure, Blake. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, first, I just want to say a uh, sincere thanks for, for having me on, Blake. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining today to listen in and to share their kind of thoughts on on the book if they've gotten it but also just to sit here and, and listen and ask questions so like, just super appreciate it. thank you i think if there's just one thing to to take away it's you know i think we all understand that the journey of building communities and growing and scaling them is it's super challenging but at the same time you don't have to do it alone. And if you uh, if you have that team that's supporting you and you're together and you have that vision, uh, community can have so much incredible impact. I think that's why we all kind of innately get involved in the idea of building communities because it comes down to the impact. It comes down to touching and changing people's lives. And so that to me is uh, super fulfilling. And if you have that in mind, I think your, your process and the things that you do to build community will be successful in the long term. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's Thursday. We're almost done with November. We're about to be in December 2020. Almost done. What a crazy year. But in order to provide yourself some sanity, get this book over the holiday break. It, it's a tremendous resource, not only for reading it there, but it's, you know, I've already got like, you know, page 140 with sustain versus or scale versus that, that chapter is already ingrained in my head. So it's a great resource and reference guide too. Um, some books like you get, you forget about it two seconds later, like a movie, you're like, okay, I just was there for two hours. What the heck was that movie about? Some community books are like that. This book is a great book to read. A lot of stuff in here but also a great reference. So you're going to want to keep this uh, next to you. Mark also has a great blog. Check that out. Put that into the chat. It, he's on LinkedIn as well. Other than that, this is Blake with CMX out of North Carolina. We've had Mark up in New York City area. Um, thanks for everyone around the world. We truly had a global audience. Link to the events at CMX um, in the chat as well for, for other stuff. But just a huge thanks to everybody here and to our special guest, Mark. And until next time, everybody, please stay safe. And if you ever need anything, you've got me, you've got Mark. We're always around. We're always here supporting other community members. Wherever you are in the game, we're around to help you out. You're not in this alone. And just thank you again and have a great rest of your Thursday, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.